Okay. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, quite a challenging topic this week, I'm afraid. <laughs> Very important one, though. Um, yeah. I mean, if anyone is willing to share, it would be interesting to hear um, when you kind of come up against this question. What, in the light of, you know, imagining looking back over your life at that moment when you know that's, you know, the story is complete. Um, what comes to mind as what would be the sort of touchstone or the benchmark, you know, for you that you would feel, well, if I had done this, that would feel like sufficient or that would feel like, you know, something I could be, I could be happy with. I know it's quite a personal question, so, you know, no pressure, but if anybody is willing to share, it would be interesting. What came to mind? Maybe nothing. <laughs> Tim, yes. I've got a couple of uh, thoughts on that one. There's sort of a, there's some spiritual ones, but there are things are Dharma things I'd like to achieve. There's also things with family. I uh, like particularly like the mm -hmm. children to have grown up and be happy and well and uh, set and secure and uh, feel that uh, my yeah. job as a parent is done almost. So. That's but actually, sort of I'm going to actually to put, you know, put that a bit more, sort of refine that a bit, Tim, because when you say you'd want them, those things to be true for them, those are not in your scope, are they? I mean, you, 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 you have your work as a parent, which may contribute to that. So what would it be that you would feel that you, you'd make you feel you'd done your job in the way you would want to? Um. I would feel that they've grown up as uh, um, ethically responsible and uh, I'd like to see them uh, doing well educationally and progressing and, and obviously the certain amount of input I've got as a parent, but yeah. Yeah, then there's the letting go part, which is probably as they uh, getting to their twenties and uh... because whatever you know, it, it, it's perfectly fine, of course, to have those aspirations for them. Yeah. Um, but though you know that may or may not be in your power to make that happen, so I think you know it's 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 important to reframe the question a little bit. It's like, what would it be that you would need to have done? For yeah you to feel happy with how you've done your job as a parent rather than this or that you know that that, that, that you may do your absolute utmost and it may have no effect <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i like to feel that i've sort of done my best and i've sort of a, yeah of helped course. them with their education and then obviously help them to grow, yeah. grow up as a, a morally responsible and, and uh yeah <laughs> members of society so i'd like them and uh, i think they're turning out so you've met my children saying they're turning out all right <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure they are too I'm sure, I'm, you know they're you know, a good example and they're no doubt I, uh, good, good kids and they're following that example i mean thank you for sharing that you know obviously that is so important and i mean it kind of you know points to why i perhaps departed slightly from the script in asking the question in that way, because I feel, you know, the way that the teaching is traditionally given, it's all about Dharma, as if that meant sitting on your cushion and meditating or doing prayers, you know. Um, but I feel it's really important that we make it real in this kind of way that, you know, um, being the best parent that you know how to be, I think that's as important as any Dharma practice. You know, it is a, it is a Dharma practice. It is like, um, but but it's kind of something that um, arises in the context of everyday life. And there's many things like this. It's that kind of thing, probably more than 
sitting on a cushion and meditating. Unless, you know, that, of course, for some people, that really is the, the, the absolute sort of single purpose of their life. You know, people that spend years in solitary retreat, that's absolutely wonderful and great. Um, but for most of us, I think, you know, it's a bit more of a rounded picture, isn't it? It's different things in the spiritual practice in the formal sense is only part of that. I once spoke to Geshe Tashi about this um, mm. a few years ago when the children were much smaller. So mm. I missed lots of classes because I was spending my time course, yeah. looking at you. They couldn't be left. Yeah. And he, he told me to regard it as, as part of my spiritual practice, which was very helpful at the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's among the most important parts of the practice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Would anyone else like to chip in there? Yes, Carol. Yeah, um, not too sure in what order this is going to come out. So we'll okay, make some doesn't matter. <laughs> um, I guess when I do, when I when I do that meditation, I find it beneficial, mm -hmm. and it really makes me question because Buddhism is a. It's almost like trying to take a completely different world view than what. Yeah. I've culturally being yeah. Yeah. brought up in mm -hmm. and this that you know what um i can't remember what part it was but it was around what like things that you would like to achieve i can't remember it wasn't what you would like to achieve but it was kind of like i imagine you know, what what would you miss doing you know when you look back what would you miss doing and i think oh you know like climbing up mount everest and uh mm -hmm. you know like I don't know, just all different wild adventures that I haven't done. And, yeah. <laughs> and I think oh, I'll miss out on that. But it's really talking about the spirit, like the spiritual practice and bringing that, like we've been discussing isn't it, into the formal and the non-informal and stuff. Yeah. But I think that's what it's really, for me anyway, what it really yes. tries to refer to. And then what would I like to achieve? So then I do think, oh, yeah, you know, walking here and there and health and mm -hmm. stuff and mm -hmm. you know okay financial well-being and all, all of that but I think it is really when you when it was mentioned around letting go isn't it it's about all of these things do clog up in my in my mind and it's about being able to just let them go peacefully like yeah. it's not an actual action as such it's a metaphor of mind like letting it go but yeah, so I think that's what what kind of came up. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I mean you're right, you know, um uh it is um framed very much in terms of the assumption that there is rebirth. And you know, for a Tibetan person, at least as as things were in Tibet, there was no question about that. That was simply like, you know, um as we, you know, as we know. The universe is very big, you know, <laughs> much bigger than probably it is in a Tibetan person's mind. We know that as part of our worldview, and for them, like the rebirth is part of their worldview, so that they they've brought up, been brought up with it from infancy. So, um, for them to think in terms of what do I take with me to the next life is completely natural. Whereas for us, that's a bit more um, difficult, and and that's another reason why I try and put it in this way. Well because because that's very powerful for me thinking about you know we can quite easily imagine that moment can't we we can you know we we, we know that's coming and we can imagine being there and looking back on our life and saying well you know um for me like the the you know if i felt that what i'd done with my life hadn't contributed something of value somehow somewhere um, I think I would feel a lot of regret. Um, and that's kind of independent of the question of rebirth. But of course, if we do accept rebirth, it brings in another dimension. Well, what's actually going to help me you know, going forward? Um, and so, yeah, we might regret not having climb out Everest if that was a great ambition. <laughs> I know that was my ambition when I was eight years old. It's uh, 
sort of faded a bit now at 67, but <laughs> probably not all that likely to happen now. Um, but yeah, I, I might have regrets about things like that, but um, I can see that's not really going to be much use to me in the next life, uh, most likely. Um, but if I have, you know, lived my life as a kind person and, um, you know, and, and um, given a lot of love and uh, care to my family, those things are important. And, and what else is important? So that's the question is really to like, to start us on a on a on an inquiry, really, because it's a it's an ongoing inquiry. You know, I'm, I'm still asking myself that question after having asked it for many years, and, uh, and that the answer still kind of changes a bit. You know, I get a bit of different things seem more important different times, and but it is such an important question, isn't it? You know, because it's what we think about the answer to that question actually has a big part in determining what we actually do and how deeply we think about it has a big part to play in you know um that we we actually um make changes Stuart yeah please well I, I'm just really wanting to agree with you really David that um I think for me what's important what I hope will be important about this life looking back is uh, whatever good I've done, mm -hmm. um, either consciously or unconsciously. I hope that's going to be important. And um, I hope that if there is an opportunity to look back on this life, not sure whether there will be, but I, I do believe there will be, um, that it will be about the, the spiritual progress that I've made. And I guess Maybe what that really now, means you know, is... we can start looking back now, <laughs> especially for me. Okay, okay. <laughs> it... Well, I, I, the jury's out, I think. You know, I think, yes. I think I'd like to wait and see. Um, yeah. And well, I, I, think it, I think when I say spiritual development, I think what I really mean is how, how much have I developed the mind, my yeah. mind? Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I guess the answer is going to come whether when I get to the point of death, really. Um, yeah. Whether I've got a stable mind at the, the, right. the point of death, and yeah. whether it, this life actually turns out to be a, a good preparation for rebirth, because yeah. I really would like to make a sure. a good start. Yeah. Um, because because I do I do feel in one way that um, a lot of what this life's been about, and I think it was uh, anyway it was Philip Larkin who made the comment about this, but I'm not going to repeat it. Um, but he said um, that. Um, you know, your early life really does sort of determine. Um, so I, I would, I'd like to carry forward into the next life. Mm -hmm. A bit of understanding that I've learned from this life. That would be my hope. Yeah. Know? Very good. So that's, that's, that's what I want to say. Yeah, great. Thank you, Stuart. Okay. Yeah, Sinjin. Jumped in as well, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I was going to make a, a little contribution and then kind of, uh, I don't know, Kind of a question, kind of a mm -hmm. question, whatever. Um, and then a technical issue as well. Yeah. <laughs> variety. Um, well, the technical issue is really, really simple, so I'll do, get rid of that. Um, during the meditations, I just find it really hard to hear you, so I spend a lot of time just kind of going like this. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry. I know that you're aware of that and stuff. Yeah, and stuff. yeah, yeah. I was actually thinking about it, and I wonder yeah. um, now that you've said it again, Sinjin, because I was actually trying to uh, being aware of the volume level, and I thought it was okay. So what I'm going to do is have once you now you've raised it again, and and I thought it was the the volume level was 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 good enough. I think I will try and get uh, some kind of a microphone that will make it better because uh you're not the only person by any means who's mentioned this problem so i mm -hmm. will um yeah i'll see if i can find something that'll some a technical solution to a technical yeah. problem <laughs> <laughs> okay thanks so much for that. yeah um so the 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 thing that came to mind for me was um basically to kind of um i don't know quite how to put it best but like kind of around authenticity and living um, my life as authentically as possible. <laughs> I'm sorry to say this, but you know, your level, volume level 
jumps up and down. And oh, really? I couldn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, the, okay. the, the, there's, there's some problem there because it, it it's not how close you are to the computer. It's it's going yeah. quite suddenly from very from quite full volume to very quiet. There is some oh, there's some kind of technical problem at your end, I'm afraid. So I missed the last thing that you said. Oh right. Um, no, I was just saying it's the first time. Hmm. Is this okay now? It's yeah. okay now. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, just about, uh, I was just saying about trying to live an authentic life. Yes. Um, and yeah, kind of, uh, yeah, be true to yourself and then true for other people. And I suppose kind of, don't know, kind of sharing your love and sharing joy uh, with, with other people. And I suppose having access to that within within myself as well so those were the very good i yeah. feel i feel like that kind of yeah if we can do that then i think a lot of a lot of things a lot of good things have come from that um yeah and uh the 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 kind of discussion point or question or whatever was around so obviously we've mentioned rebirth um and like i've heard a, a lot of a lot of stuff you know in buddhism that specifically talks about the moment of death so mm -hmm. um, being prepared for the moment of death mm -hmm. um and then we've talked about you know kind of looking back on your life and that um uh is is the kind of the moment of death thing is that specific is that is that kind of basically a synonym for uh, that kind of process of looking back on your life and hopefully not having too many regrets um or is it based on an idea that basically you're going to be really afraid when you die or when you're about to die and and mm -hmm. uh you know you want to be able to to kind of um i don't know yeah control your mind and and uh and all of that uh at that time yeah um, well, I mean, there's two things that can happen at the, at the time of death um, uh, that are not desirable. So one is intense regret and the other is intense fear of what's coming next. Um, and those are, you know, in the, the way that it's thought about in the, you know, these traditional Tibetan teachings is that those are very connected. If you've not lived your life in a positive way, then first of all, you're going to have regrets. You missed out on the opportunity of using this precious human rebirth in the best way. And secondly, you're gonna have a lot of fear because if you haven't purified negative actions, if you've done negative actions in this life, you haven't done positive actions, then um, you're, you know, you're headed for suffering. Um, and so for two reasons, you'll have fear. One is you may have a premonition that that's the case whether it's based on, you know, uh, having a Dharma view, so you know, you've, heard, you, you've had the teachings about, you know, if you uh, live your life in a negative way, you're gonna experience suffering in the next life. You may, may be based on that, or it may be based on something else. Um, but also, um, if we haven't practiced, then we'll die with a lot of attachment to this body and this life. Um, so, um, you know, they kind of, the, 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 these things go together that yes, we want to create positive karmic imprints that will mean that we, we, we have, uh, you know, a, a good rebirth and we have, uh, are able to continue our spiritual practice. So for that reason, you know, we're practicing, but also, um, the practice itself is one of reducing attachment. And so the less attachment we have, the less fear we're going to experience. So in all of those ways, you know, um, the, the practice should, um, first of all, make the death experience less troubling. And we may be able to die with complete peace of mind. I mean, you know, the, 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 that, that many people do. Um, not everybody does experience great fear at the time of death, 
Um, but it, it it very much depends on how you've lived your life. I think we can we can probably understand that without having to go to traditional Buddhist teachings. You know that that uh, you think someone who's had a lot of attachment and lived their life based on attachment and not thought about you know um, benefiting others or practicing moral discipline or practicing training and awareness and so on they are the people that are going to have the most difficulty with the death experience itself and also then on the other side because the um the rebirth that you take is also it's very much dependent on the state of mind at the time of death so if you die with 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 great fear or with strong anger uh, which sometimes happens you know, um, those kind of negative state of mind um, or, you know, you have intense attachment and you're, you're absolutely sort of distraught with grief that you're having to leave behind uh, your possessions or, 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 or some, some person. You're dying with a mind of very strong attachment or very strong aversion, fear, anger or whatever, um, then that is going to condition a suffering rebirth is the way it's it's thought of um so that's really how the you know how the karma operates between one life and another so although you know in a way we have to take this on trust because <laughs> we can't remember you know and we can't uh, you know we can't sort of follow another person through the death process and rebirth or not at all well certainly very difficult if it's possible at all for most we can we, we can't really do that so we have to take it on trust but but also um we can it, it makes sense that's the thing isn't it if there is a future life then the idea that if we die with a very positive mind that then the next life is going to be more positive it, it, it it's kind of logical you know so we can we can look at that aspect. I mean, one can go deeper into it. Um, it is, as you know, as Carol said, it's a bit challenging for us that these teachings are so deeply based in this worldview where rebirth is taken for granted. So, so many of the kind of uh, reasonings that are used to sort of reinforce our motivation for spiritual practice are based on past life and next life and all of these things and. If we find it, you know, we have, if we have a lot of doubt about that, then um, we have to either find a different way to think about it or find a way through the doubt. Um, it's, but for me, it, it isn't so much a question of, you know, that I want it to be proved because I think it's very difficult to prove it. Um, to anyone's satisfaction um, but when I when I look at it and ask it does this make sense does it hang together is it reasonable the answer is very very much yes you know um, I saw a video <laughs> the other day uh, it's a five-year-old Chinese boy playing the piano now, when I say playing the piano, I mean, this was a very difficult piece of Chopin that he's playing. He's five years old and this music is absolutely fantastic. I mean, he sounds like, a, a, you know, a fully mature concert pianist and he's five. You think, how can he even get his fingers around the keys? And I'm saying to myself, he's, he's practiced before, you know, <laughs> he didn't learn that in two or three years. You know, I can't believe it. How did he get to be that good on the piano at the age of five? I'm thinking, it's the only sensible explanation I can give. <laughs> he must have had previous experience. Quite extraordinary to see some of these, these kids, you know. Um, so that's one thing. But, but, but you know, yes, it's, 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 it's plausible in that. I find it plausible in that kind of way. But also... Um, thinking slightly differently about it you know maybe we can't prove it or disprove it so what's going to be our working assumption 
So we could say, well, my working assumption is there's no rebirth because that's my culture. Or, you know, I, I like Tibetan Buddhism, so I'm going to follow that belief. But we could also say, which, gonna, which one is, which view is going to have the best effect on my mind? And if I look at it in that way, I can really see, you know, uh, this idea of rebirth is very powerful as a way to think about, you know, um, ethics and spiritual practice and Yes, do it, please. I'll learn to unmute myself at some stage. Okay. But my, <laughs> um, my, my working assumption is, is that energy sort of just transforms. It doesn't, yeah. doesn't go. So that's, that's my working assumption. Yeah. But one of the things that um, the, I just wanted to give you some feedback on the, on the meditation. Yeah. What the meditation did for me was it bounced me back to when I was about 16. And right. I think I'd chugged along very happily until that point. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting on a bus, I think I was going to work. And that was the first time that I ever had any consciousness of um, the fact I was going to die at some stage. Right. And I just wanted to, just wanted to yeah. feed that back to you, that that's what mm -hmm. the meditation's done for me tonight. It's sort of exactly. bounced me back to that. that yeah, time. yeah, that's interesting. Relevant. Mm. to mention that really but but as i say my yes. my working assumption is and i think scott peck in um um one of his books have you come across scott peck i have come across scott peck yes he's a sort of buddhist sort of sort of buddhist christian <laughs> okay yeah let, let's let he mentions the buddha and i don't want to get into a sort of yeah yeah he's a he's a spiritual uh, teacher, yeah. but he sort of says so he's coming from a different perspective and he says well, whatever it is that that sets us up to be, is you know efficient in terms of efficiency. It doesn't make sense that we just stop when we die. So ah, true. <laughs> but, so or you know triangulating those points. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy to go along with that. Anyway, there are many many ways to approach it. I mean, to, to actually, um, one of the things I find most convincing is when and I've been I've been talking about this quite a bit actually, you know. Um, because I recently read another one that there are uh, now an increasing number of contemporary first-hand accounts of people who've had an experience of enlightenment. And those people, I mean, I, you know, I think uh, uh, Eckhart Tolle is somebody that I, I, I rate very highly. And, 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 and when he talks about it, you know, there's absolutely no doubt in his mind. And, and he's saying, you know, I know from my direct experience that, that, that the mind cannot be just you know disappear uh, into non-existence uh, i just read another rather similar story which is very interesting but, you know that's that so that's one of them um yeah there's there, there are many things i had an experience once and i guess this is also something that people it's not not all that uncommon of you know meeting one of the young tulkus so this was the reincarnation of um, uh, one of Lama Zopa's teachers anyway, his name will come back to me in a moment. And, and he was, I think four and a half years old. And uh, I was in Bodh Gaya actually, uh, when the Lama Zopa was there. And um, this was about 20 years ago. Uh, and this little boy came up to me and he was, you know, he was going to take me to see this puppy. He wanted me to see this little puppy. And first of all, the, um, you know, the sort of authority in his voice was like, you couldn't, you, you know, you, you just had to do what you were told. <laughs> like, and it was very gentle, very sweet. And, and he took hold of my hand and it was the most softest, gentlest touch I've ever experienced. It was really almost like shivers ran down my spine, just the way that he took hold of my hand and took me to see his little puppy that he was excited about. I thought, this is not an ordinary four-year-old, you know, this is something else. So there are many, you know, there's many ways to approach it. Um, and, and, and now I think now actually surveys show the majority of people in this society actually do believe in it, which is interesting. Because it's not 
you know, it's not in our culture. And yet it's it's become a very widespread belief. But I think probably if even if you'd taken a survey a hundred years ago when it was really not part of the culture, you'd still have found a significant proportion of people. I think it's something it pops up every now and again, you know, out of context. People have this idea and you wonder, oh, where did that come from? You know, <laughs> this person's had no exposure to Buddhism or anything. So maybe it's more, and it's in a lot of cultures as well. It's, you know, how a kind of post-enlightenment European culture is one of the few that doesn't have the idea of rebirth, actually. So, yeah, it is something, you know, I mean, it's, uh, um, there are also people who are sort of, um, especially people like Stephen Batchelor who are talking about, well, you don't need, you know, we, we don't need the idea of rebirth in Buddhism. I think that's, possibly questionable that if you take rebirth out it's still really buddhism <laughs> question to be asked if you look at you know the the, the pali canon the most uh, oldest uh, uh, buddhist teachings that we have there's hardly a single sutra where it's not prominent so you have to say you're changing buddhism quite a lot to take rebirth out but the point is well made though that that that, that a lot of the things that you know um, the, the really important principles that Buddhism is about can be spoken about without it. And, you know, um, yeah, anyway, it's, um, but it's a very important topic all the same. So, you know, if we, if we, especially if we're trying to follow the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, It's not going to work without rebirth. <laughs> it's so central. It's so important. So fundamental. Um, and and I think you know there are many things in that tradition that are really special and precious that I wouldn't want to you know be without. So for me, it is. It's a bit more than my working assumption. I think. I think you know. I would say, yes, I do. Not infrequently have doubts about it, but basically, I'm convinced. You know, you know, having thought about it for many years and looked at it from many angles at the end of the day i come down to and i believe it because there's you know there's so many there's so many reasons to believe it and so many you know people who speak convincingly of experiences uh, that that indicate that it's probably the case you know um one thing that kind of when that has helped me because it's not really about focusing on death as such but mm -hmm. when I really look at you know not really look but when I think about how much suffering some people go through mm -hmm. and then how some people seem to be born you know the royals for example like are born into a lot of wealth and mm -hmm. prestige and and whatnot mm -hmm. and and then you know people are somewhere in the middle and yeah and whatnot I think that really made me question you know how is how is that so you know how mm. does oh yeah how does that make sense and I know other beliefs might have a different way of making some sense of that whatever but when I really when I think about like contemplate that I'm like you know I can't quite follow some of the other ones I can yeah. you know fair enough but I'm like oh but it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me, you know, but when you think, when I think about karma and I'm like, oh, okay, that, and not only does it make sense, but it gives a little bit of, yes, a little bit of hope too, that, you know, right. you can still bake a wonderful cake with good ingredients or bad, bad ingredients, so to, so to speak, you know, you can still have a end result that's the, the Thank you, thing, Carol. If, That's if a really were. important point about it, actually, and that which I didn't mention. Um, you know that it, it it it's as a way to make moral sense of the world. Um, it really, I do feel uh, it's very important. Is that you know? Yes, that uh, you know. How can we? How can we respond? How can we kind of mentally? Uh, orientate ourselves to the vastness of the suffering that's in the world and if we think well 
yeah but that's not all there is there's you know that there, there is you know it, it continues it's not just that billions of people have these meaningless lives which are just full of suffering and then it's all over i can't don't know how to make moral sense of that but if there's that continuity then as you say yeah there's 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 another way to look at it which really you know um I mean, we have to be very careful, <laughs> sort of, you know, if we're thinking about kind of karmic, uh, I don't want to use the word karmic justice, but um, uh, there was a famous occasion where the, the England football manager got into a lot of trouble for saying something about how, well, disabled people may have, it may be their karma from a past life that they've got this disability and got into a lot of stick for saying, you know, kind of blaming these people who are suffering. Of course, it doesn't have to be understood like that. I mean, the, the, the fact is we, from Buddhist point of view, we all have a, a, still got a lot of negative karma. It may still, we may still, maybe next time round, you know, <laughs> may come back and bite us. It's not, it's, it's the same for everybody, but it, it can be misunderstood and it can be sort of, you know, um, but um, it can also be a way that we can, um you know not have to fall prey to some kind of nihilism and despair about the world yeah and i, I do think that's really important so thank you for bringing that up yes Stuart, you had another one yeah one last one last one I, yeah i mean I, I just intuitively see it like i go to bed at night i fall to sleep yeah um, I dream mm -hmm. and I get up tomorrow morning and that's the way I sort of yeah. see death, the bar Pretty good analogy, yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly how it's spoken about like this. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, so we should, you know, we should go to bed, uh, go to sleep with a positive mind. <laughs> yeah, and obviously that's much easier to do if you spent your day in a positive way, isn't it? So it's kind of like that, you know, if we do that every day, then we'll live our life in a positive way. And then we'll approach death in a positive, with a positive mind. And then we'll wake up in the next life and things will be more positive. It's very simple. <laughs> there are more complex teachings about it, you know, that through, through, through deeper forms of meditation may actually be able to um, remain fully aware throughout the death process and, and actually, um, you know, use our spiritual, use spiritual methods to um, actually control that process. But here it's like, well, these methods that are being taught in this particular, these particular practices that we're studying, these are among the best ways to ensure that not only that we have a positive rebirth so that we have good situation you know healthy body and mind and so on but also that um, the conditions are the best most favorable conditions to continue practicing and to actually reach enlightenment So, you know, it is very helpful to think about these practices in terms of death and the next life. And that's, of course, is how they are explained. So really, this meditation on death um, is very, very important, you know, not just to kind of um, help us to um, reflect about, OK, what's what's my, what's the purpose of and make some adjustments in our life but really to to make a shift you know on a deep level um can i put it um to really you know to really get where we want to get to if we're talking about um this as a path to full enlightenment and this is how we think about it as a mahayana practice you know that's our goal um then or even you know if it wasn't even if it was only so-called lesser vehicle hinayana uh, you know and our our goal is to is, is nirvana that's a very very 
high goal already. And to get there, we need a very powerful motivation. We need, and so I've spoken, you know, constantly <laughs> throughout these teachings about motivation and how important that is. And this is the most powerful, most important practice for strengthening our motivation. It's really fundamentally important to making the difference between scratching the surface of the spiritual path and really beginning to go deeper in where the spiritual practice has really major effect on our life. This is, and so Lama Yeshi, when talking about this, used to say, you know, this should be our practice. Meditation on, on, on death awareness and impermanence should be kind of like our main practice. Um, and even, you know, in the high tantra teachings, death awareness is right in the foreground. It's not something that we do at the beginning and then we move on to more advanced practice. It's not at all. This is throughout our practice, right up to, you know, the stages of, um, of enlightenment, really, you know, this is in, in, in different ways, um, in different aspects. But this meditation on death, is right at the heart of this Mahayana practice. Um, and this is what will, as much as anything else, uh, if we do it seriously, will um, enable us to actually get the realizations. Right? It's kind of like, I don't know, some turbocharger. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, uh, this is what this is what will give our practice real power to to change our experience, change our our awareness, our, our change our life actually. So I will just um, speak to the text a little bit, um, and then maybe I don't know if there's going to be more questions or a bit more meditation, but basically. The next Thanks. section of the text, which I sent on the email. Um, so, yeah, everyone's here. Hey, right, yeah. David. Yes. Can I just jump in with a, a bit of a, a question or a. Okay. Um, so, obviously, we're, we're, um, we're doing these meditations and, and um, they're about our own death. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm aware, you know, uh, also do meditations on other people's death uh, mm -hmm. and also find them that yeah. very useful you know mm -hmm. um i suppose uh what i'm wondering is are those kind of relational kind of meditations i don't know is relational the right word but mm -hmm. anyway um yeah. uh are, are they where do they fit in with uh with kind of you know, you're talking about the fundamental importance of, of um, yeah. death awareness uh, uh, mm -hmm. to our practices and so on. I, I'm just wondering where where do those meditations fit? In? Okay. Um, well, I mean, I can think of two kinds of situation where you would meditate on someone else's death. Um, the first one, which I do sometimes, um, and I think it's a good meditation to do um, is when we kind of bring to mind the fact that someone you know someone who we have a we talked about it being relational someone we have a strong relationship with might be a family member or, or somebody that we're close to and remember you know bring to mind uh, generate a sense of mindfulness that you know we could lose them any time so not in, you know to kind of just become paranoid, <laughs> but you know that, that that our interactions with that person, um, we should if 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 that's in the back of our mind, then it will bring a certain quality like an edge to our interaction with them. That you know um, if we're able to interact with somebody with the consciousness that well this might be the last time I meet them, you know. 
So whether I might die first or they might die first, um, then you'd really bring some quality to your interaction, wouldn't you, with that person? Um, and, you know, things like um, the regret that people sometimes experience when the, the last interaction they had with somebody, they didn't know the person was going to die, and the last interaction they had was an argument. We don't want that, you know. Um, so it can, I think that's a useful meditation that we can do. Sometimes think about, you know, people that we're close to, may not have them forever, make sure that I don't waste the, the time that I have with them. Um, that's not really, as far as I know, uh, uh, talked about in the traditional Tibetan teachings. Um, the other situation is where somebody is actually dying. Um, and, and we know this, or they are approaching death, then, um, you know, it's a very important time to practice um, things like, you know, compassion meditation for them, um, to practice, uh, you know, kind of ritual practices and prayers that you might have a connection to, for example, medicine, but a practice, you know, for somebody who is, even though we may feel, well, there's no real possibility of um, uh, preventing that person's death. But if we do medicine, but a practice for them at that time before death or while they're dying or after they've died, these practices um, are said to have a very powerful effect. But the Tonglen meditation is, well, Lama Zopa has I written a book about this actually called How to Enjoy Death. I think it's now been republished under a slightly different title, but um, yeah, this is it's a collection of his teachings on death. And it is about, a lot of it is about how to approach our own death, but also how to deal with, you know, other people dying and practices that we can do when people are approaching death or when they have died. Um, and it's, I mean, I, I'm, if, 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 if that's a situation that you're, that, that, that applies to you, I really highly recommend this book. And it's, uh, you know, it can give you a very different perspective. If you are able, Lama Zopa is very, uh, very traditional in his approach in, in, in some ways, in the sense that, you know, um, devotional practices and, 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 and rituals and tantra, tantric practices and this kind of thing, he's very, very kind of, um, you know, strong on those. So not everybody finds that easy to relate to, um, but um, it, it's, it's enormously powerful, uh, I find. If you, if you can relate to those kind of things, um, yeah. So, but Sinjin, is, is that kind of, I'm not sure if either of those kinds of meditation is what you were referring to by meditation. I was kind of referring to both, to be honest with you. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, like use them for close loved ones and also, um, yeah, uh, of a family member who's going to die uh, and yeah. my dad is also going in for surgery. So they're a bit more mm. in the second category, you know? Right. Yeah, well, the book, you know, and I th I'm, I'm not sure whether... I mean, some of these you can probably download some of these practices, but the the, the book um, I think is just amazing. Actually, if you're able to relate to that kind of practice, you know, um, the the you know sort of you know what I mean, pujas and mantras and that kind of thing. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, because gotcha. he's talking very much from direct experience of having, I mean, he's constantly working with dying people, and does his practices for people all the time and, and, and is absolutely, you know, uh, there's 
it kind of you know speaks from a, a, an authority and a certainty that these practices work that he really knows from first-hand experience that they work um, and that can really be uh, hugely helpful to people sometimes both to the you know the dying person directly if they're able to relate to that kind of thing or to the people who are you know uh, close to that person um, or if it's somebody that you know that you're connected to yeah very very helpful extremely helpful cool thank you mm. okay so um i'm just kind of a bit whizzing through the text but really this section that i sent on the email is basically just slightly more detailed um and slightly more traditional instructions on this particular meditation that we did called the meditation of the three roots of death so the the three roots are the certainty of death, uncertainty of the time of death, and the fact that at the time of death, only our spiritual wealth, it says here, is of value, or only our, our spiritual practice is of value. So those are the three basic points. Um, and the more deeply we can, you know, bring those realizations alive, um, I mean, it's hard to deny any of them, actually. Certainly the first two can't be denied. We know that it's going to happen. And we know that we don't know when, even though we sometimes get ourselves, you know, we, we, we tell ourselves a story. I mean, I tell myself the story, uh, I'm going to die sometime, you know, in my 90s, perhaps, but um, could be tonight. You know? um, and... And actually, most of the time, we don't think about even the fact that we are, the fact that we're going to die, as Stuart said, you know, 16 years old, the first time. Although I'm sure well before that, you you kind of knew that intellectually as a, as a fact, you knew that everybody dies. But the realization that I'm going to die, and then that kind of hits you in the gut. That's very different, isn't it? You know. And so the more that we can really bring that vivid awareness that, 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 that this is how it is yes you know we only have so much time and we don't know how much <coughs> and it trickles away <clears throat> you know we suddenly find there's a beautiful line from the pink floyd you'll know the one i mean and then one day you find 10 years have got behind you no one told you when to run <laughs> uh, yeah uh, familiar feeling isn't it you know <laughs> and so this is why you know the 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 the, the lamas and the you know the first Dalai lama here and all the teachings you know there is this message you know they are ramming that point home so that we don't forget um because our our built-in tendency is to kind of we 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 just let it slip away and and then we suddenly my god you know like suddenly i'm 67 my goodness you know <laughs> what <laughs> never expected that <laughs> um so so it's urgent you know um I mean, I'll leave you to, and I highly recommend, you know, if you haven't done so already, reading through this portion of the text. Um, like I suggest, if you're able to do so, read it through carefully and then do the meditation and try doing that a few times during the week if you can. So these, you know, these reasons. So for each each of these three roots, there are three reasons and three conclusions. Right? So the first one, you know, the, the 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 first root is the certainty of death, and the three reasons. Um, 
he's the, the first one actually i think the way that he explains is slightly different from the usual way the usual way it's um, stated is that um, there is no method to prevent death here he says you know meditate on how the lord of death comes to all living beings it kind of comes to the same thing you know it's going to come to all of us um you know, so no matter what kind of body we have or where we live or which historical era we live in, um, that doesn't get us out of the, you know, there's no get out of jail free card, <laughs> which is a similar <laughs> thing, isn't it, to there's no method. Um, and then the second reason, which we contemplate, you know, to reinforce this, this um, point that death is certain, Second reason is that our life is constantly passing, you know, it's, it's kind of trickling away like sand running out of the glass. Okay, or you can think of a candle burning down. That's a very powerful one, I think. I like that one because, you know, it kind of brings the, the next one into it as well. If we think of our life as a candle burning down, if we think it's actually more like the flame of the candle, isn't it? You know, if the body is, is the candle, and the flame is the life force that keeps the body alive. The candle is a bit more robust than the flame, isn't it? And our physical body will continue after the life force disappears. But in this second point, you know, it talks about the, that life force being very fragile, just kind of like the candle flame. When it um, refers to roots, the three roots, yeah. Is it roots in samsara or roots in what does roots signify or roots in what or? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, actually, I'm just looking at the text here and he says the first root theme. So it's kind of like, um, I don't think it's, it's not massive significance of the word root here. I mean, uh, on the previous page, he says, you know, this involves three principal themes. So the, um, three points, just, just like three, three main points. That's, that's really all it means, yeah. Um, but then for each one, there's the three reasons. And then there's, for each one, there's one conclusion. So the conclusion of the first one, the, the, you know, the, the, the root or the theme or the point is that death is certain. The reasons are because there's no method to prevent it, because life is constantly slipping away. And because the third one, which is slightly different. The, the, the way the third one is usually stated is at the time of death, only Dharma will help. Sorry, no, the, I beg your pardon. That's the third one. So the, the third reason here, the first root, <laughs> is um, that whether I practice Dharma or not, death is still going to come. That's the way it's usually stated. But the what he's here talking about is, you know, how easily it can happen that we don't practice, even if we know we should and we want to, and we think we're going to practice. But for this and that reason, constantly gets put off, postponed, other things get in the way. Um, we have less time than we think to practice because we have to do all these other things, you know, and then we'd end up not doing as much practice as we thought we were going to do. Right. Does that sound familiar? It certainly is to me. So these are the three reasons. And then the conclusion is, you know, because death is certain. Therefore, I will practice Dharma. OK. And when I, you know, um, at the beginning, I was kind of wanting to make the point that. Um, what do we consider to be Dharma, you know, is 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 whatever is of benefit, of genuine lasting benefit to oneself and others. So it doesn't have to be sitting on a cushion and meditating. It could be, you know, something, just the way that we relate to people in our life, you know, doesn't have to be a formal Dharma practice as such. It certainly doesn't mean it has to be a Buddhist practice specifically, you know, but, you know, underlining the importance. We do not want to die without having done certain positive things in our life. So that's the 
first conclusion. And then the second root or theme or point is that death, the time of death is uncertain. And the three points here are our lifespan isn't fixed. So we know this, you know, we know that people can die at any age. There are endless examples, limitless examples of people who've died at any age you care to name. <clears throat> The conditions for death are many, and those for life are few, it says. <laughs> there are many, many, many different ways in which we can die. You know? Can I just make, make a comment? Yeah. Um, it's interesting that when um, people hear of somebody else dying, the, the first question they ask almost always is, oh, how old were they? Mm -hmm. it, it's like people are continuously making comparisons. Yeah. Think, oh, only 30, oh, that was awful, you know. Uh, yeah. And so on. Yeah. People always make that comparison, don't they? Yeah, we, we don't think it's going to happen to us until we get to 80 or 90 at least. Um, but it often it's not like that. I remember <clears throat> I had a very good friend um, studied at Oxford with me and, and um, he became actually became a um, professor at Cambridge, <clears throat> um, and he was very popular. Um, and I hadn't had any contact with him for many years. And uh, um, I went to um, a lecture at Leeds University that he was giving. And he was very surprised to see me. So he was then in his fifties, and we'd known each other when we were in our mid twenties. You know. And about 18 months later, and, 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 you know, he was extremely healthy, you know, no problems, everything, you know, having wonderful life. Um, about 18 months later, I heard that he'd, he'd, he'd suddenly died. He'd, he'd, he'd gone and played a game of squash, had a heart attack and died. And I was really shocked, you know, because it was like so contrary to my expectation that this person at this age, who was exactly the same age as me, you know, um, and in perfect health and everything, you know, suddenly gone. That really kind of, really hit home. I guess we've all had those kind of experiences probably. And it, it does reinforce this point, you know, we think it's not gonna happen. We really don't know, we really don't know. <clears throat> I think a lot, a lot of it is kind of how people, well, it's how you relate to death and it's like, uh, I remember when I was studying, uh, they did. There was like a, a paper that said that basically, like nurses relate to, and it's back to what um, you were saying, David. It's that the you know, depending on the age of the person, or or you know, if they had whatever physical condition or whatever. So it's, it's but it all comes back to how we relate to it mm -hmm. and how yeah how we understand it kind of collectively as well as individually, like mm -hmm. uh, what sense we make of these things. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I just, yeah, it, it's, I'm thinking about a lot of this kind of stuff, um, thinking around this kind of thing in the context of how you relate to people, you know, the loved ones of people who do die, but who with whom you don't share a Buddhist kind of uh, mm -hmm. understandings and stuff and just trying to yeah. Yeah. kind of get my head around that. I mean, obviously, I know how to relate kindly to people, but yeah, it's just, it's just... It's very, just, very important uh, question, uh, Sinjin. Yeah, you know, and, and I think um, it's no secret that there's a lot of unhealthy things about the way that death is generally thought about in, in, in this culture in this society um yeah this sort of mass denial around it isn't there um and um it's seen purely in negative terms um which when you think about it it's very straightforwardly it's like well it's gonna happen to everybody and if death is always negative then you're just kind of bringing so much negativity into the world and your attitude to the, you know, how can there be, there can't be life without death. Um, they kind of, you know, they go hand in hand. 
like night and day. It can't be night without day or day without night. It can't be life without death or death without life. So, um, yeah, and I think it, 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 it is quite important as Western Buddhists for us to think about that question that you raise, you know, because if our answer is just having a very literal minded belief in rebirth, then for a lot of people, that's not going to be helpful at all. Um, but there are other ways to look at it. There's other ways to think about impermanence, isn't there? You know, like, um, <clears throat> um, I mean, you know, I suppose very, just very simply, because uh, I was speaking to a very close friend earlier today whose brother is apparently dying of cancer. And he's not a Buddhist, she is. Um, so very poignant, you know, I mean, she has very deep love for him and he's going through a lot of suffering and fear um, and trying to, you know, thank you, Carol. Look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. <laughs> okay, thanks, bye Carol. Yeah, Carol's coming to my compassion training class. And, yeah. Um, yeah, so I was thinking about this very question, you know, how do we, uh, offer something from the Buddhist perspective, um, that is useful if people can't necessarily relate to the idea of rebirth. And I really don't think that is the only handle that we've got. Um, what I said to her was, well, you know, for everybody, it's got to be the case that our life has a beginning, a middle and an end, you know, we, rather than looking at, you know, um, well, there's so much of my life has gone on, there's only so much left. And then, you know, that, that can be a way to induce fear. But if we, we look at our life as, how can I look at my life as a whole? What meaning did this life have? And she found that a helpful thought, you know, because um, he has had a very positive life, her brother, you know, and whether or not he's interested or could possibly consider the idea of, that he's going to continue, but he can look at, okay, well, what kind of a life have I lived? Has that, has that been a good life? And, um, very young people sometimes can relate to their death in that kind of way, actually. It doesn't have to be, you know, it's not a quantitative matter, is it? It's not a matter of how many years you've lived or how many years you've got to live. It's a matter of what's the, you know, what's the meaning and value of the story that your life is? Oh, it's... <laughs> Another video that I was watching the other day, this is part of the compassion training thing. This, this little girl, and she's this is this is a real thing, you know, that happened. And and uh and interestingly enough, there's actually film of the very start of this because she was in the supermarket. So she's actually sitting in the shopping trolley, and her mom is pushing the trolley through the supermarket. And coming the other way down the aisle is a very old man with his shopping trolley. And this little girl um, turns towards him and says, hello, old man, she says, and she reaches out and gives him a hug. Nobody knows why. This man was suffering from really serious, really severe depression. His wife had died quite recently. And this little girl who's five, became his best friend, you know, and they were kind of, you know, they were absolutely inseparable. The mother was talking about it. She's absolutely baffled by this, you know, and she just loves being in his presence and he loves being with her. And, and, and there's so much joy is happening here, you know, and you think this, this man who was just looking forward to his death with nothing but misery and grief, you know, and, and very little left to live for. And suddenly, you know, in the last 
kind of episode of his life, this beautiful, joyful relationship with this very, very young girl kind of put a different perspective on it, you know what I mean? So we have this very kind of mechanical view sometimes about death, don't we? It's like, oh, we've got to squeeze another two years out of life so that, and then what? I mean, it's no better if we die at 83 than 81, really, is it? Unless something like that happens, which has nothing to do with an amount of years that we've lived, does it? You know, what's really meaningful in life has nothing to do with that. So it's not, you know, when we think about the way that death is normally thought about, it's as if it was better to have lived 90 years pretty miserable than 30 years of, of, of you know, um, super, supreme joy and, 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 and love, you know, which, which is more meaningful. I don't know if any of that's helpful, but maybe it's kind of points towards the kind of things that I think about. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, well, the other thing that I said to her, it, you know, if, if, if you are with somebody who is uh, dying, is the very most important thing is just to be with them, to be as much as with them as you can be, if you understand me, to be as present with them and to, really you know connect as deeply as you can and that can be that can make an enormous difference and what's so tragic is that often the attitudes towards death that people have really block that get in the way of that um and, and too much anxiety and fear and, and 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 not wanting to you know like not wanting to tell people that they're dying that's crazy you know, it's not going to help. So we have a lot of thinking to do. I mean, I think it's a big task, actually, for Western Buddhists, because I think a more wholesome relationship to death and dying is one of the greatest gifts that Buddhism can bring to Western civilization, especially, you know, um, when it is predominantly materialistic and atheistic, because for all it's a very rational kind of view of the world, it doesn't help us much with this aspect of life. You know, I'm not saying that people should believe in rebirth or that they should believe in God, but um, the materialistic view of life doesn't give us much to work with that helps around the time of death. So I think, you know, Buddhism has a lot to offer, and but but we need to do a bit of translation work to, you know, in 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 the Tibetan tradition it's harder because they do have this very definite literal minded belief in in rebirth, and and we maybe don't or we can't rely on that in order to support people who are dealing with those issues. But uh, yeah. Very important stuff. And I've heard as well, by the way, I'll just mention that Venerable Rabina Cortin is um, doing some teachings all about this at uh, Land of Joy. And I think she's basing it on Lama Zopa's book, which she edited. So, you know, if you're particular interest in this subject, you might want to look at uh, Land of Joy's website for those teachings that are coming up. Uh, because, you know, you can bet she's going to give value for money <laughs> she's class yeah, yeah 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 okay great well that's been very uh, good i think let's let's just uh take a few moments to digest some of those thoughts and prepare to dedicate our practice Yeah, so just settling back into contemplative state. And we'll just do that. We'll just take two or three minutes to reflect back on any points that may have 
been significant for us to take away, take them into our hearts and minds, bring them into our practice and our life as we go forward. So we can rejoice deeply that we've actually spent these last two hours in a very positive way. Not the easiest topic, but great, great spiritual value in facing this reality of impermanence, one of the most important foundations for our practice. So we can be sure we have created much positive karmic potential and we can dedicate that. with a strong wish, may it result in myself being able to develop, continue the spiritual path, gain the realizations quickly so that I can bring help, relief, peace, and joy to others. And we set the dedication prayers. <clears throat> May the precious bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen never decrease, but increase more and more. Just as the brave Manjushri and Samantabhadra have realized things as they are, I dedicate all virtue in the best way so that I too may follow after them. We'll do the two long life prayers in Tibetan. <clears throat> Kangri rawe korwe ching kam de pendang de wa malu jung we de chen re zi wang ten zin gat so yi shape si te badu ten yo chi Tup tu chang jing jam gun gyo we ten zin kyong pa we kun zo dog po de chok sum kor we leg mun tu du pa dog sog du je gun du jap ten cho. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. See you next week. Bye. 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 Take care. Mm.